Have you ever got a compliment from someone when you put on new clothes? I have. It could be a new shirt, maybe a blouse, a dress, a suit, anything new. Some of you may not have known this, but I got married rather late in life, at the age of 41. I call that my 40 plus years of wandering in the wilderness. <laughs> when you're a bachelor for that long, you have certain habits and lifestyles and certain wardrobe that is indicative of singlehood. <laughs> but when I got married, probably one of the biggest changes that occurred was my wardrobe. I went overnight from Costco clothes to J. Crew. And people noticed, <laughs> thanks to my dear wife. Today we're gonna see a different kind of wardrobe change, not one with clothes, but one with a different type of living. It's a result of the gospel and the spirit working together that helps us to be like Christ. It's an enablement and an empowerment that's unlike anything else. This morning we're gonna be going through a passage in Colossians chapter three, verses 12 through 17, and I've entitled it, Putting on Christ. So if you have your Bibles, and we also have it on the slide here, let me go ahead and read this passage to you. Colossians chapter three, verses 12 through 17. This is God's word. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ rich, dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians is about the preeminence and the priority of Christ. And in the situation at Colossae, there are a lot of philosophies and ideologies that were challenging that notion. But Paul is very clear that there is no one, there is nothing better or greater than the person of Christ. And that backdrop theme sets us up for our passage this morning where we're going to see how because of that reality, there's going to be a certain outcome or effect that results from this. Let me begin with verse 12. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Let me stop here. Paul often uses this idea of clothing metaphor, and it's really fascinating. If you are a Greek person, that means that this is an indicative versus an imperative. And what is that in English? Let me say it this way. Indicative is a reality, and an imperative is a reminder. And I think what happens sometimes is even though there are things that are true, that are happening, that are reality, we sometimes need a reminder, an encouragement, or a nudge to do this. That's what Paul is doing here. The reality is we are God's chosen ones, or some of your Bibles say we are God's elect. We are holy, meaning we are set apart and we are beloved of God. And so through this, what Paul does is he sets up this metaphor of putting on, and also earlier on in verse eight, of putting off. So the kind of the transaction is this. It's kind of like seasonal changes of clothes. After one season, you put off something, and then you put on something new. But in verse 8 in the previous chapter, chapter 3, he's very clear of what we are to put off. And it's actually vices. Listen to this, verse 8. But now you must put them all away. 
anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. That's not seasonal anymore for a Christian. That's the old self. And what Paul's saying is, put that off, release it, and now replace it with the new wardrobe that is an adornment of Christ. And this now brings us back to verse 12. Again, I want to emphasize the reason why we can do this is because God has empowered us. He has chosen us and enabled us to do this. He has set us apart from sin, and he has set us unto Christ. And because of that, there must be a different kind of lifestyle that results from that. Look at the virtues that are listed now in verse 12. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. All of these are godly virtues, and I can't think of a better person who sums this up than Christ. That is what Paul is exhorting us to do, to put on Christ and all these qualities. Now let me make two more quick observations about clothing metaphor. I think there are two implied ideas within this idea of putting on something. One, that it's noticeable that people can actually see that you have a different apparel. The other idea is that it's willful, that it's not something that's forced, but that it's an invitation to really adorn all of Christ in his radiance. And because of that, you and I, as the chosen, holy, and beloved ones, we get to represent Christ, amen? Amen. And that's a high calling. And in that calling, if we can understand this, this is something that's not just done at church, not just done at Biola, but it's done in life in the world so that people can see this. This now takes us to verse 13. We see the qualities or the virtues in verse 12. Now verse 13 enacts it by giving us the means in which all those qualities can come out. Look at what verse 13 says. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, then forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so that you also must forgive. Let me unpack that phrase, bearing with one another, even if a person has a complaint against you. When I was in high school, I worked at Taco Bell. It was pretty fun, actually. (laughs) But I'll never forget this one person. A customer came in and ordered something very unusual. So I went up, I said, hello, how can I help you? And he says to me, I'd like a bean burrito, hold the beans. (laughs) And I said, again, please, come again, what what does that mean? He said, I want a bean burrito with no beans. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's a tortilla. (laughs) Mm. And I said, sir, if I charge you for a bean burrito and hold the beans, it's much more expensive than just a tortilla, which I'm willing to give you. And you know what he said? He said, can I see your manager? I have a complaint. And so I said, okay, that's not necessary. So I turned back to the cook and I said, order a bean burrito, hold the beans. And he's ready to put it on. He's looking at me like, what? I said, hold the beans. What an unbelievable and incredible uh, request. That's a small snippet of what might happen in life, right? There are going to be unbelievable and unreasonable people in our lives. We live in an imperfect fallen world, do we not? And yet God gives us the perfect will of how to live and how to be in light of that. And that's why I want to exhort you this morning to put on Christ all of these qualities to adorn it so that when you have to bear with one another, when they complain with one another against you, you have the means to forgive one another, as it says in verse 13. And Paul is always good about this. He gives us the reason why. Right, millennials, that's our big question. Why, why, why? My little boys ask that question all the time. Why? I ask them to do something. I think they're stalling. (laughs) But really, they want to know why. And you know what Paul says why we should do this? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. 
if you think about it, there's really no reason for Christ to forgive us, right? But he did. And there's no reason for him to die on the cross other than his love, but he did. And if you remember in Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in our trespasses. We followed the prince of the power of the air. We were disobedient. We were children of wrath. Not a very pretty description. Yet, but God in his mercy and grace loved us, died for us, and has even risen us, or raised us up with him in Christ. Let's go to verse 14 now. It continues on, and there's yet another exhortation to put something else on. And above all these, put on love. So this is kind of an expansion of the earlier put on from verse 12. And the description of what this love does is it binds everything together in perfect harmony. As we watch, whether it be the NFL, the political scene, or social media, we can certainly say we're missing love. But as believers, we can demonstrate that because it's not just our love, it's the love of God that's empowering us so that we can then love our neighbor as ourselves. But the question now is, how do you know that you have put on love? In other words, how can we make sure that this is part of our apparel? Well, I would say the answer is we need to look in the mirror. And the mirror for us is the word of God. So let me take you now to a cross-reference. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, is probably one of the best listings of love. Here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Here's what he says. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As you look at this, one of the interesting things is that these are all descriptions of love in terms of a verbal sense. They're not just listings or qualities, these are things we are to do. So if that's true, let me ask you an application question. As you look at this mirror of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as you see whether or not you've put on love or not, would you be able to put your name in place of the word love? In other words, if I were to say, is love, is Ben patient and kind? Does Ben not envy or boast? Is Ben not arrogant or rude? Does Ben not insist on his own way, or is he not irritable or resentful? Does Ben not rejoice at wrongdoing, but does Ben rejoice with the truth? Does Ben bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endures all things? You see, if we have put on love, we now become the embodiment of the love of Christ. And so you and I have a huge opportunity and responsibility to demonstrate that, especially now in a world that's not really very loving to one another. The end result of this, goes back now to our passage, is that it binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let me encourage you as believers, as an in-house family talk, let's start with us first. And then as we do this, let's model it to a watching world so that they would look at Biola, they would look at your church, they would look at Christians and say, I think they figured it out. And if you can say, yes, we have, you can point to Christ because Christ is the answer. Now let's keep going, verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. This is not only a promise, but it's an exhortation that when the peace of Christ overrules you, when he possesses you, you will have peace. And then you will have peace that will allow you to be unified into one body. And when you see that, be thankful. Be thankful. Now, I want to take a little bit of time to unpack verse 16 for us because I think it's a pretty important one, and especially for us who are younger, you who are younger, not me, but uh, it says this, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In our tradition of the conservative evangelical wing, we, we kind of think that it's the Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. 
Um, but it's not only that. It, the scripture is very important, don't get me wrong. And certainly the Holy Spirit is very important as well. But I want to suggest to you that this verse not only exhorts us to be in the word of God daily and deeply, and you get to do that, 30 units of Bible and all that good stuff, but I want to suggest to you there's kind of a two full idea of what's going on here. It's not just the word of God that helps us to grow and teaches us and admonishes us, but there's another means by which we grow, and that is through singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And you're like, what? Yes, music can help you grow. And so in this, let me just unpack this again for you. The cool thing is this, it's not just one genre of music. It's psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So again, let me just exhort you, different genres I think can be used for the glory of God. I think it's possible. And so in light of this, let me also point you to something else that's really interesting. It is dependent on the music to be able to teach you something and to instruct you on something. Let me tell you a kind of a sad story. I used to work at UCLA in the chemistry department. Now, this dates me. I used to listen in the back to a cassette tape, and it was this praise music, and there was this song, and the song was entitled, Call the Elders of the Church. Now, if you're biblically astute, you know that comes from James chapter five, someone suffering, call the elders of the church. But I'm playing this song, and this is a secular environment, and the song goes like this. Call the elders of the church, call the elders of the church, call the elders of the church. It just repeats over and over and over again. So I'm working in the lab, I'm listening to this music, I'm like, I'm not really enjoying this song, but I, I get it. <laughs> and then this chemistry student, a grad student walks in, and she starts laughing and mocking the song. She says, call the elders of the church, she's just dancing and call the elders of the church. She's not a believer, and she's just dancing around because she thinks this song is so comical. And finally, she turns to me. She says, Ben, what should I call the elders of the church? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. It's not very clear in the music. See, a song like that doesn't teach or admonish me. It's just on this loop. And it's not helpful. A song that is helpful and will teach us is like one of my favorite hymns by Charles Wesley, And Can It Be? Let me read you one verse from that. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. I get so moved by that because it's not about me, it's about what Christ has done for me. Remember when we worship and praise, we're not praising ourselves. we are praising God. He's the one who is worthy. Worship is not about us, it's about him. And so let me just encourage you, if you are a songwriter or aspiring songwriter, of any genre of spiritual Christian music, would you write meaningful things that don't just repeat in, repeat in this endless loop so that an unbeliever might actually hear or see something like maybe the gospel? <laughs> Enough of that, I'll stop preaching. Let's keep going. <laughs> it says now as it's closing off in verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, one of the things that I think is really incredible about the scripture is it's not forceful. It's inviting. It's not that you have to do this. It's you get to do this. You get to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That includes studies. That includes relationships. That includes your work. Here's one that's gonna hurt. That includes driving on the freeway in Southern California. Wow. You get to be a representative of Christ and do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you do that, then the response again is giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you see how that comes all throughout this passage? Be thankful, give thanks, and again, give thanks. Why? 
because God has chosen you. He's called you, and he's allowed you now to put on a different kind of wardrobe, a different attire that is radically different so that a watching world would be intrigued. Let me ask you a question. Are your unbelieving friends intrigued by you? Because they know that you go to Biola, not Loyola, but Biola, and you get to represent Christ clearly. As we think about this, Let me ask a few questions of application, and then we'll close our time with the final central truth. First question, would you say that now as a believer, your lifestyle is noticeable and different? Right, because we said that clothing metaphor is noticeable. And hopefully you're putting it on because you choose to because you are holy, beloved, and chosen of God. So when you go out into the world, outside the Biola bubble, would people say, wow, this person's really different. I I can see it. I can hear it. I can feel it. And this next question, do you then choose to put on these virtuous qualities of Christ? Qualities like love and peace, do you choose to do this? It's right there in your reach. The Spirit of God helps you. The Word of God directs you. And the people of God allow you to practice. Now it comes down to you. Do you choose to put on the adornment of Christ? And finally, when you think about all that you do, is it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory? Or is it for our glory? Everything, our music, our lifestyle, our studies, how we love and who we love, is it done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? My prayer is that as you understand that God has given you everything you need, that you would take it, that you would put on the full apparel, that you would adorn all of this. So here's my final central truth. We are called to put on Christ because he has chosen us and enabled us to embody Christ-like virtues for the glory of God. One more time. We are to put on Christ because he has chosen us and enabled us to embody Christ-like virtues all for the glory of God. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.